we're absolutely delighted to have uh, Stefan Szymanski, uh, who is um, the Stephen J. Galetti Professor of Sport Management at the University of Michigan. Of course, he needs almost no introduction, introduction, introduction uh, in this in this setting. We're all uh, familiar with uh, Stefan's work over many many years, um, groundbreaking and quite profound in its contributions. Um, and um, I'm afraid I've not got your title to hand, Stefan. So, but I believe it's something on COVID and football, which I'm looking forward to. And um, yeah, please do do take it away from here. Do you have it to hand? Okay. Can you see the screen? Not yet. Not yet. No, sure. That's why yeah. things, things are moving now. Again. There you go. The impact of COVID nineteen on professional football. All yours, Stefan. Okay, thank you. Oh. Right. So thank you very much. Uh, a blank screen, Stefan. Sorry. Oh, there you go. Now we've got it. Good. Carry on. Sorry. So, uh, so thank you very much to Dimitri and James and all the other organisers for laying on this wonderful event. Um, I will say one of the benefits of COVID-19 is that I think the international um, body of scholars in sports economics is meeting more often, and that can only be a good thing. So um, there are some silver linings. Uh, but also thank you to everyone who's hang on all day. Uh, I know it's been a long day, so um, thank you for lasting out this long. I will confess that uh, you started at 4 a.m. this morning, my time, so I wasn't there till the beginning. But um, what I've seen today so far, I really enjoyed. Okay, so um, uh, you might be aware that a couple of months ago I gave a paper at the... Um, uh, Rose's uh, seminar series on insolvency uh, and COVID-19. And so in some sense, this uh, presentation is a follow-up to that and updating with some, with some more thoughts. Um, and of course, uh, uh, we're all guessing about what's going to happen in the future. So um, I'd be very interested at the end of this to hear what others think as well. So I've sort of broken this down into sort of six sections, uh, talking about the nature of the shock then thinking in very broad terms about the economic impact in terms of aggregate supply and demand for football, then thinking more specifically about how it impacts, how it relates to market structure. Then I'll say a little bit about insolvency and insolvency and the financial impact. And then uh, really my conclusion relates to some of the implications for ultimately for market structure. So uh, COVID-19 would uh, is the, uh, economic shock of all shocks, of course, completely, almost completely unanticipated. Um, and of course, this, this sh economic shock in particular has direct impact on sports um, because of um, the susceptibility of uh, uh, people to the disease in um, spectator sports environments. So we can really envisage four stages of this, uh, of the response. We had the initial closure where we'll have, uh, we've started on reopening with in-person attendance. At some point, we will go to reopening with in-person attendance and some restrictions. Um, and then uh, maybe, hopefully at some point, we might go to full reopening with pre-COVID uh, conditions. So these are all impacts directly, and that's separate from the indirect macroeconomic impacts that this crisis will have on football uh, and sport in general. So let me just say a couple of words about the indirect effects. So um, these are on the left, you can see uh, some OECD forecasts for uh, member states uh, for GDP in 2020. Um, they're forecasting uh, GDP declines of between five and 10%, even without the double hit of uh, a, a, a renewal in um, the autumn, September time, the flu season. Um, so uh, clearly a, a pretty dire effect. But bear in mind that the, the 2008 crisis, which was, was big, I mean, may, we'll argue about, we'll, we'll have to wait and see whether, whether it were, turned out to be bigger or smaller than this, probably. Um, but still of similar dimensions, at least. The, that didn't really impact uh, football that much. So the chart on the right shows you um, uh, the uh, revenues of the, the top two divisions in England, which is probably a fairly good indicator broadly of the, of the overall impact on revenues. And you can see there 2008 has just no impact whatever 
on the revenue profile. So um, even though people were badly affected and it was a, a very bad macroeconomic shock, the effect on football was, was actually relatively limited. So why would it be different this time? Well, it could be that the scale of the, of the, of the crisis is going to be bigger and maybe um, that's, uh, there's a, quite a bit of optimism that strikes me at the moment about uh, because of the reasonable success of government interventions, the promise of a vaccine and uh, the um, prospects that people will learn to adapt um, to social distancing rules in most of the world, apart from, uh, well, Russia, Brazil and the United States of America. Um, but um, there's reason to be skeptical that all of these are going to work and uh, it might turn out to be much worse. Um, but of course, the other point being that football is directly affected because um, this is where the, the, the crisis is focused, where the demand shock is really focused. So it's going to be more directly involved this time. So here's a simple way of thinking about modeling supply and demand. We think about demand as being a function of, well, of course, price, but also consumer income, talent, and the regulatory environment. And we can think of it as a probably a conventional aggregate downward sloping demand curve for football and the supply function, which will have this kind of inverse L shape where you can think of below capacity, effectively supply is perfectly elastic. And once you reach capacity, supply becomes almost perfectly inelastic. So below capacity, you can think, well, what do you mean by capacity? Well, you can think of either the, how many games you can play in a fixed period of time. There's a limit how many games you can play. Uh, and then, but also you can think about it in terms of stadium capacity. There's a limited number of people you can fit in stadiums or, or indeed broadcasting capacity. There's a limited number of uh, minutes that you can uh, cover on TV or other broadcast media. So here's the sort of initial impact of the shutdown. So this is the kind of economic equivalent of the sound of one hand clapping. You have demand didn't go away, but supply did. And so you basically have completely ineffective demand. Um, so, and this is where we are at the moment, reopening without attendance. And what actually you could think is that at the moment we're experiencing a shift, a rightward shift in demand. There's this pent up demand uh, to watch games and uh, the, some of the ratings figures for games uh, have been um, uh, extremely high um, and uh, there's quite a bit of evidence of that. So you might think that that's actually bringing an economic benefit to football, although because most of this is written into contracts, broadcast contracts that have already been signed, there's limited scope for the, for the clubs to, to benefit directly. But you think in terms of revenues, um, this is actually providing a benefit to broadcasters at the moment um, in what's a very different environment for them to be. When we go back to reopening with in-person attendance, what? One way to think about that is it's really certainly in terms of attendance at stadiums, you could think of that as being a fairly radical shift to the supply curve to the left, because there's going to be much less capacity for people to watch. And um, at the same time, I think there are a lot of people going to be reluctant to go. Certainly people my age or, uh, uh, or, or even younger are going to be fairly reluctant to think of going to stadiums in the future. So there's always like, likely to be a downward shift in demand. But nonetheless, you might think that this is a revenue opportunity as well. Um, clubs might be reluctant to raise their prices, but it's certainly you'd think that, that they could raise their prices significantly, given that the restriction on supply um, and uh, the, the, that is going to be imposed. So when we go back to full reopening, here's one scenario, which I think is quite likely, is that demand will remain uh, depressed for some time to come. I think it'll be quite a while before we get back to things being normal, mainly because of the persistent concerns about the risk. And if you haven't uh, looked at it, um, look at the paper there by Cardazzi et al that uh, was presented at the Roses seminar a, co a couple of weeks ago, which talked about the relationship between professional sports and uh, influenza. And they gave, I would say it's a pretty powerful paper suggesting that um, uh, uh, these uh, major sporting events are, are spreaders, uh, super spreaders, if you like, and um, it seems quite likely that people are going to be concerned about that for some time to come, and therefore I would expect to see a significant 
a, a reduction in demand, and that might um, depress revenues uh, for some time to come. But here's a more extreme scenario, the kind of what you call the catastrophe scenario. So where the shift in demand is so dramatic that actually the demand curve now intersects the horizontal axis and you're going to see effectively a reduction in supply. So this is where you might think that, 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 that football clubs disappear and, and, and uh, that the sport becomes much diminished. Now, I think this is, I think this is quite unlikely. And I think uh, you'd have to imagine that that ultimately football's going to cease to be a popular spectator sport. And I don't see any real um, evidence of that that's likely to be true at the moment. There are no real harbingers of that. I mean, it's possible, but I, I just don't see very likely. And we've also got the evidence of previous large shocks, um, which show that demand usually does snap back uh, sooner or later. The examples you could think of are um, evidence on major league strikes in the US where um, people always say during the strikes that, oh, the fans will never go back to baseball or whatever the sport we're in. And of course, they always do, uh, or they always have done. And also, another good analogy, perhaps, is, or partial analogy, is wartime football so, uh, during the Second World War, where it, the sport was dramatically interrupted uh, everywhere. But in the UK, we can see how, we, we can see how much it was interrupted. And as, as soon as uh, the war was over and they could go back to playing professional football. Um, not only did the crowds return, but actually they uh, increased substantially. There was substantially more demand after the Second World War than just before the Second World War in, in the UK. However, that said, there have been a lot of people involved with football talking about catastrophe scenarios. So uh, back in March, Andrea Agnelli talked about this being an existential threat to football. Uh, there's a very interesting study done by Ernst and Young uh, in Sweden, where they said basically 14 out of the 15 professional clubs in the top division uh, are likely to go bankrupt without some kind of capital support. Um, uh, there's this quote from uh, Dennis Budasic, who talked about 100 to 200 clubs going bankrupt uh, uh, in September, October. Uh, Damien Collins in the UK, an, an MP, has launched his own six-point plan to save football. Uh, uh, he says we have only a few weeks to save football. He said this back only uh, well, back on May 22nd, so not that long ago. And um, around the same time, Mark Palios, the former CEO of the Football Association, um, said, talked about uh, large-scale bankruptcy of these two. So um, there's been a lot of concern that this is... Um, really going to be catastrophic. So how do we make sense of that? Well, um, I wrote a book, uh, published a book in uh, 2015 called Money and Football or Money on Soccer, and Soccer, depending on where, which side of the pond you happen to be on. And in that book, I argued that there are two characteristics of professional football, dominance and distress. And by dominance, I meant that the same big clubs win, dominate the leagues each year um, and that's true uh, wherever you go. Uh, and so um, uh, we're all familiar with cases like sort of Germany, for example, where Bayern Munich was just the 10th title they won in a row, something like that. Um, but if you look at really small leagues like the Faroe Islands, it's exactly the same. Uh, you don't know, probably most people have never heard of HB, the, 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 the big team in the capital of the Faroe Islands, but they have dominated the Faroe Islands League for decades, really just like what the Bayern Munich has dominated the Bundesliga. So it's not a matter of the size of the country, it's more something that's institutional in football. And the other aspect of this that, that I argue is that goes with dominance is distress. The majority of, of clubs live on the verge of uh, financial collapse. Um, and um, many of the businesses that own football clubs consistently go bankrupt. Even though the football clubs almost always survive, um, there are very few examples of any football clubs of any size disappearing permanently, yet the businesses that own these football clubs regularly go bankrupt. And I argue that the relevant model for thinking about this is John Sutton's model of endogenous sunk costs. So uh, Sutton's book published in 1991 was um, uh, kind of a, a major advance in industrial economics. Um, Typically in industrial economics, we've been used to the idea of exogenous sunk costs. So that's where 
firms have to invest in, in tangible fixed assets with limited alternative uses and that this investment creates natural monopolies. So the, the best example always to think about this is the water supply. The, the fixed investment in building a network of pipes makes competition absolutely nonsensical. It's clearly a natural monopoly, so you only have one water supply company. The only question is how to, how to regulate it. What John Sutton pointed out was that in many industries that are not characterized by exogenous sunk cost, you still see a small number of firms dominating the industry. And he argued that this is because of what he called endogenous sunk costs. And this is where businesses through the process of competition invest heavily in fixed assets, but usually intangible fixed assets, which create barriers to entry, even if ex ante, the industry is potentially competitive. And his classic example is Coca-Cola. So there really is re very limited realistic barriers to entry into the soft drink market globally. And yet Coca-Cola dominates, Pepsi-Cola is, is, a, is a not too distant second, and then everybody else is nowhere. And the reason for that, he argued, is because of brand advertising. They advertise heavily in the, in the brand. They spend billions each year on advertising, even though everybody knows, who hasn't heard of Coca-Cola? Everybody knows the name. But the reason they're investing is to create a barrier to entry. Anybody wanting to enter would have to market on a similar scale. That represents too big a barrier realistically for any entrant, and therefore that sustains a dominant position. There's a competitive fringe of companies that try to that produce soft drinks on a small scale, but none of them can rise to the level of Coca-Cola or Pepsi. And I argue that in football, it's not advertising that is the source of the endogenous sunk costs, but investment in players. Players are recognized as intangible fixed assets, just like brand advertising is recognized on the balance sheet of um, uh, many uh, marketing companies. And that uh, this investment then represents a barrier to entry so that the dominant clubs un do not face significant competition. And here is an example is um, the revenues of, this is from last year's financial statements for 63 of the professional clubs in England. Um, and uh, what the, 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 the figures on the chart are the revenues. And you can see that there's a small number of clubs at the top that dominate. And after you get past club number six, there's really a very big fall. And when you go to the bottom, there, there are really very tiny clubs that are not realistically are going to be able to compete with the big clubs. And if you look at the correlation between the revenues and the intangible fixed assets of these companies on the balance sheets, the correlation coefficient is 0.92. This competitive fringe can survive. Actually, if they were just businesses, they wouldn't. They could, most of them are losing money, but because they are really community assets as well, they always get bailed out by somebody. They get brought back to life. Um, otherwise, they really, in, in, if, they, if it were just a regular business, they would actually. So here's some evidence on um, profits and profitability taken from UEFA's club licensing reports. And uh, UEFA um, uh, uh, has been touting these figures for several years now, actually. These basically, the, the green line represents the profitability of clubs in the top divisions of Europe. So bear in mind there are 54 um, associations that belong to UEFA and UEFA collects financial data on uh, all, the, all the clubs in the top divisions of its member associations. So it's a very large database of, uh, it's a roughly, I think it's seven, 800 clubs in their database. And they've been looking at these and they claim that since the introduction of financial fair play, which started around about 2009 and has been coming forth gradually over time. So this has led to the increase in aggregate profitability as measured by the green line, which is what they measure. What I did which, uh, to contrast that is to take out of that operating profit, the reported operating profits of clubs in the English Premier League, the most profitable league, um, foot, football league in the world, Bayern Munich, Real Madrid and Barcelona, the three mega clubs uh, outside of the UK, and saw what and looked at what's left of the profitability of the top division clubs in Europe. And you can see 
the red line is their aggregate profitability and um, they're in a sea of red, meaning that they are on average below zero. They just peaked up above the water just briefly in 2017, but sank to again below it uh, soon after that. And you can see that the, the improvement in those clubs has not been significant. What we've seen actually in the last decade is really a growing consolidation financially of the biggest clubs and the smallest clubs continuing to struggle financially, which is consistent with the endogenous, song, the endogenous sunk cost story. If we just look at the financial figures for England on its own, you can see here in the Premier League, you can see aggregate profitability measured by EBITDA. EBITDA is earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization, a popular measure of profitability, which really, in fact, there's lots wrong with EBITDA, but the re main reason for focusing on it is if you don't have positive EBITDA, you really cannot generate a profit at all. Um, and you can see here that the Premier League is vastly profitable, but the Championship League One and League Two, the three divisions below that, all uh, on, in aggregate sustain significant losses. And that's even without including the clubs that are missing and the more likely or, or not you didn't report your financial statements, the more likely it is you may be in bigger losses. And this is true across Europe. Here is um, from, again, from the UEFA club licensing reports. This is all of the clubs whose, uh, this is looking at the ratio of assets to liabilities. So you're also insolvent if your uh, liabilities, what you owe, are greater than your assets, what you own. And all the clubs, all the leagues in the uh, shaded red area have uh, uh, liabilities greater than their assets. So they're all technically, all these smaller leagues are te technically insolvent. And basic, bear in mind that this is on an aggregate basis by league. If you took out, even in the leagues where in aggregate they are, uh, have uh, positive net assets, it's probably the case that there are a lot of clubs in there with negative net assets being sustained by one or two clubs. So the picture in general is uh, of many clubs close to insolvency. And again, if we look at the case in, in England, you can see that in the Premier League, net assets are substantial, or in 2018-19, net assets were substantial, two and a half billion uh, pounds. Whereas the net assets of the Championship League One, League Two clubs, they're all negative, so they're all, in some sense, technically insolvent. They owe more than they own. And if we just run, I, I ran some, for based on the 2018-19 data, I ran for the simple solvency test based on, you need to be solvent, you really need positive EBITDA and you need positive net, net assets. Um, so 58, percent of clubs would fail the EBITDA test, 58% of clubs would fail the net assets test. And if you just look at how many what, what how many clubs fail both uh, fail at least one of these tests, then more than three quarters. So less than a quarter of clubs could be said to be in uh, a healthy financial condition based on this data. And this leads to this does actually lead to insolvency. Bad, bad balance sheets, bad pro low probability does lead to insolvency. And uh, I've been working on this for the last decade or so, uh, uh, looking at England and then with uh, Nicolas Sells and Daniel Weimar looking at France and Germany. And one thing we point out is that this is, sometimes this is attributed to bad governance, particularly in England. Um, a lot of critics in England think that for example, Germany is better run. And we looked at the German case and found that we get just as many insolvencies in Germany as we find in England, and just as many in France, although we don't have as much data for the lower division. And the point is that this is not really a, a question of whether there is financial responsibility going, uh, being applied. It's not whether there is rationality and discipline. This is really more about the nature of the competitive structure, the way that competition works. And what is the biggest risk factor for insolvency? Well, it's very clear if you look at the data, clubs that become insolvent in the years running up to insolvency are dropping places. They are losing their rank in the divisional system. And if you lose 16 places, 
you're almost certainly going to be relegated. And it's the relegation. When you're relegated, you are driven down to play with teams that are less attractive, attract fewer fans, where you get uh, smaller, you, you attract fewer sponsors, you attract lower broadcasting rights. So insolvency is a financial, uh, so relegation is a financial crisis in its own right. And what's the rational thing to do faced with the financial crisis of relegation? Well, it's to spend money to avoid relegation. But then if you do get relegated, well, that's just made your problem even worse. So it's not something, it's not an irrationality of the system. It's, it's a logical consequence of the operation of the system. And that's, I would argue, that's why we see so much insolvency, not just in England, but across Europe, across all football leagues, pretty much anywhere in the world. So essentially, but what this is saying is also that football has, to a large extent, been bankrupt. And this was all true before COVID-19. This, this was true even before we get to the crisis that we're in right now. So if you think about what a shock does to create insolvency, well, just look at these two examples. The left-hand example is England uh, and the spike. This is a, it's a measure of the number of insolvencies per year. And you can see that spike in 2002 and 2003 here, and that's caused by the uh, bankruptcy of ITV Digital, which was not so much that the bankruptcy was a shock, but the football clubs uh, believed that the broadcasters who owned ITV Digital had signed a guarantee um, and would cover the, the cost of the broadcast contract. It turns out the lawyers had failed to get the um, broadcasters to sign the guarantee even though the contract was written. And as a result, the uh, broadcasters refused to honor the guarantee. They took it to court and the judge said, well, if they didn't sign it, they don't have to do it. And so that was a real shock. Nobody expected that to be true. It was a real screw up by the lawyers, obviously. And um, that led to this sudden spike of insolvency. A roughly similar thing happened in Germany in 2001 when uh, Kinovelt, the, which was broadcasting um, football in Germany went bankrupt with a broadcast contract unpaid, and you see also a spike in insolvency. Here. So it's not unreasonable to think that a shock leads to insolvencies, and obviously we're in the middle of a very large shock at the moment. And I've done a little bit of uh, thinking about a little bit about what would happen uh, if uh, what this shock would imply. And here in this example, I think about revenue losses. Um, thinking about a 20% loss in revenue, what effect that would have on EBITDA, and then also um, a loss of deferred revenue. So deferred revenue is the payment of season ticket money in advance that the clubs typically receive um, in the months uh, toward the end of the season and before the following season starts. That cannot be recognized as revenue until the following financial year, so it is recognized in the accounts for the current year as deferred revenue. And right now, those clubs, most clubs, I assume, have lost a significant amount of deferred revenue as people have, at least some people, have not renewed their season tickets. Um, that, those combined effects would lead to a dramatic decline in profitability from having an aggregate across the four divisions of nearly a billion pounds in terms of EBITDA they would have losses of more than one billion pounds of EBITDA as a result. Now, uh, we'll see what that, what that turns out to be um, when we see the financial accounts for next year, but Deloitte published their annual review just recently, and in that, their forecast was that the clubs have lost 17% of revenues for the current year, so somewhat similar to the assumption that I made. Um, and they didn't, they haven't, they haven't looked at the deferred revenue issue. Um, so that's, that's in addition to the problem that they've identified. This is data taken from Transfer Mark. I'm sure everybody's familiar with Transfer Mark, which tells you the value, uh, the estimated value of players based on it's a crowdsourcing site. So these are these valuations, you need to be careful. These are not actual sums of money. These are what people think players are worth, but they are lots of evidence has shown they are closely correlated with actual auditing values. So um, it's not a bad guide for thinking about valuation. And what's interesting about this, I, I, I downloaded the figures for all of these leagues uh, uh, on March 
from March 1st and on 1st July, you, the transfer mark allows you to look at what the valuations were in the past. And you can see here the average decline in the valuation of player contracts is 18%. Now, of course, these are intangible fixed assets on the balance sheets of the clubs. So the clubs have seen a roughly 20% fall in their, in their intangible fixed assets, which would, on the average club based on the English data, would represent something like 10% of the assets of the business overall. So again, think of you, you're, you're a business with assets and liabilities. Your liabilities don't change, but suddenly you lose 10% of your assets. What's going to happen? You're going to be insolvent. A significant, there's a significant chance of becoming insolvent as a result of this fall in the valuation of your assets. And indeed, um, we've seen several clubs, we've been some discussion about several clubs being on the edge. Surprisingly, many of these clubs are actually in Germany. Um, uh, Malaga in Spain is one, but Karlsruhe in Germany came within an ace of uh, insolvency. Schalke 04 has been in uh, a lot of problems. And if you're wondering where to find this information, there is just a, I've starred there, there's just a brilliant survey um, online, um, uh, the Sport Law and Policy Center and Law and Sport Joint, Joint Survey, which is, has immense amount of detail about the responses to the coronavirus. So if you wanna see what's actually going on, I, I strongly recommend you download this report. It's about 400 pages long, so it's really, really detailed country by country. Um, Several clubs have not been paying wages, we, we, know, we know, and several clubs have also been refused licenses, uh, club licenses for, based on financial grounds. And just the last two weeks, we've started to see insolvencies begin. So FC Kaiserslautern filed for bankruptcy on the 16th of June, and Wigan Athletic just two days ago entered administration. So quite plausibly, this is the beginning of an avalanche that we're going to see grow over the coming months. Now, there are some mitigating factors here. So um, already UEFA have waived licensing conditions uh, in order to uh, limit the harm to clubs and uh, national associations. Uh, I, I haven't studied it in detail, but I presume most of the national associations are doing similar things. So that will prevent some of the technical ish problems that clubs might face if they're not granted licenses to compete. We're also going to see and already seeing reductions in player wages, and that's also almost inevitable at the, at the bigger clubs. Um, and a lot of people think this is the answer. Uh, I'm skeptical about this. So firstly, to say that it's, it's never been that unusual for player wages to be unpaid. There's a lot of players with unpaid wages out there, which is one of the were the unspoken scandals of, of football. Um, and um, uh, one of the reasons why this doesn't get much attention is because this applies to the overwhelming bulk of professional players who are not paid very much. So uh, the median wage of a professional footballer is around 30,000 euros, which is hardly a princely sum. Um, and so wage cuts in those cases are not really going to, not necessarily going to make much of a difference. Um, uh, now, on the last couple of days, FIFPRO has announced a scheme that it's going to work with the UEFA on trying to keep clubs afloat. And there is presumably some scope for doing that, like I say, in the bigger clubs, but I'm skeptical about whether that's really going to be the best solution. Government can step in and give emergency support. That's happened a little bit already. Um, however, you know, I, I, I do wonder how effective that's going to be, given that governments have their own prob have prob much broader problems with the macro economy, and football is not necessarily going to be the highest priority. We'll, we'll have to wait and see about that. Um, of course, people think that the governing bodies have large sums of money, and certainly FIFA is sitting on a very large war chest. But again, once you spread that out amongst the clubs, there are potentially thousands of clubs in need of financial support, and FIFA surplus would pretty quickly disappear if you spread that out evenly across all of those clubs. The one thing that's going to have to happen in the face of this crisis, if clubs are to survive, is injection of new capital. And that has been the norm throughout the history of football. Throughout football's history, clubs go bust, somebody steps in, has, becomes the savior of the community, gets all the prestige for doing that, and the club continues on its merry way. Um, and uh, 
the, one of the problems at the moment is that the whole club licensing process over the last decade is actually getting in the way of that process. It would be much easier if those restrictions were not in the way. But now potential benefactors are looking at this and say, well, what am I going to be allowed to do? What can't I do? Um, and does it really make it worthwhile for me to do that? I mean, my suspicion is that UEFA are going to um, adjust their behavior significantly to, in order to encourage the ejection of capital. And in my view, that will lead to at least temporary suspension of some of these um, licensing restraints. We've already, in fact, we've already seen that, and that might continue into the future. And we might see an overhaul of the licensing system since um, the club licensing system seemed designed almost to discourage the injection of new capital. And I think UEFA are now going to realize that actually that's the last thing you want to do. You want to encourage the injection of new capital because that's what's going to keep the football floating in the water. So I just want to talk about some implications of all of this um, as I sort of get to the end of this. Um, so will clubs disappear? So I think that's just unlikely. So um, in the short term, who's going to demolish a stadium? Uh, you know, there's always going to be a stadium there. And they're all going to be free players. I mean, you know, I'll, even in the extreme case where players have to become amateurs, they'll still be willing to play. So in that sense, you, um, football is infinitely scalable. You can play it on a, on a very small scale indeed. Um, and so the likelihood of clubs, be, it being necessary for clubs to disappear in the system is, is very limited. And insolvent clubs will be acquired by new owners and whether they're investors or, you know, this certainly many people see this as, and I think this is a reasonable point, see this as an opportunity to enhance the role of supporter trusts. And I, I, I'm perfectly, I'm very supportive of that. I think it's a very good idea. Um, and so that would probably, that, that would also ensure that many of these clubs survive. So I think it's a disappearance in itself is unlikely. However, if you think about what that means in a context where revenues are very likely to fall and more likely to fall in absolute terms at the top than at the bottom where revenues were already small, then the likelihood, in my view, is that the distribution of revenues amongst clubs actually is going to become more equal, bizarrely. Not, not perhaps what you'd expect, but it seems to be the likely implication of this. Which in turn will make the league not less competitive, but more competitive. Smaller clubs will have a better chance of competing against the big club because the gap in revenues will now be smaller. Now, when you think about it in that way, you start to think about, hang on here, the big clubs are not going to like this one little bit. They do not want more competition. And so it seems to me they're likely to try to look to ways to restrict competition in order to prevent this compression in revenues from having an effect on them directly. And the most obvious way to restrict competition is to end promotion and relegation. The thing that makes uh, football so incredibly competitive, even given the dramatic inequalities within the system, is the system of promotion and relegation. And we can already see that there has been action taken to limit promotion and relegation across the world uh, during this crisis. So in an extreme example, Liga MX in Mexico actually in April decided to suspend promotion and relegation for five years. Well, I don't know, five years? Is it really coming back? Doesn't sound to me like that after five years they'll find a good reason why they shouldn't bring it back. So that's a pretty extreme example. But in the Netherlands, Eredivisie has suspended promotion and relegation. Where they did that when they cancelled the season in April. An interesting case uh, in France Actually, not the league, but a French court blocked the relegation of Amiens and Toulouse from League One. They didn't, pr they didn't block promotion, so that's enlarging the league. Um, but you can see how that might lead to some re-evaluation of the whole promotion relegation system 
uh, in the longer term. In Scotland, Hearts have threatened to have to litigate their relegation again. We not seems not unlikely that we're going to see more action in the courts, uh, and that might also lead to some reevaluation, promotion, relegation. And in England, the League Two clubs specifically asked uh, for relegation to be suspended for the current season. Um, so the League Two clubs are part of the Football League, which is the three divisions, the Championship, League One and League Two. And my understanding is that the Football League turned down this request on the grounds that if they acceded to, this, to the suspension of promotion relegation at the bottom of the system, then they would soon find the Premier League suspending promotion relegation at the top of the system. And these clubs didn't want that. But then you can start to see how pressures are beginning to build. And there's more. Now, I expect so, several people, certainly some of the people who've been here longer, started to giggle when they saw this, the title of this, a European Super League. We've been talking about a European Super League for the best part of 30 years. Um, I've, I've written about it, lots of other people have written about it, and it hasn't happened. Uh, there's an argument to say that the big European clubs could play each other more regularly because they have the best players and they don't play each other very often. And uh, whilst in principle, it's, it's, uh, you can see the benefit, you can certainly see the value to broadcasters and therefore the value to the clubs of showing, for example, Liverpool, uh, Real Madrid playing more every season or more, um, but it, it hasn't happened yet. However, in the current situation facing in a crisis with revenue crisis that we're, we're, we're facing, then this suddenly becomes even more attractive than it has been. So this is precisely the kind of time when you might see this kind of uh, innovation come to pass. I'm not saying it will, I'm just saying it's a possibility. And if that were to happen, it's always been problematic to think about how promotion and relegation would work in such a system. And um, there's certainly arguments that, that many of the clubs might uh, choose uh, or certainly prefer to have a Super League without promotion and relegation. And of course, what would that be? Well, football without pro promotion and relegation is the American model of closed league. And if that were to happen, if, if the top level of European football became a closed league system, then the small clubs really would disappear. And the analogy here is minor league baseball in the United States. If you go back to the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, there were dozens and dozens of minor leagues all across the United States, independent minor leagues that operate. Um, in my state of Michigan, there were, uh, there's, there's a website which shows at least 20 or 30 leagues that operated even in Michigan, which was, well, the population today of Michigan is only 10 million and it would have been even smaller back uh, 100 years ago. The minor leagues, the independent minor leagues in the United States were wiped out by broadcasting, first by radio and then by television, where people could see high quality uh, baseball and the minor league teams had no access through promotion relegation. And that's, to my mind, exactly what would happen if we ended up with a closed league system in Europe. Um, and uh, I, for one, don't think that's a good idea, and I think it should be opposed. I think the problem is, you know, how to square the circle, because I think in many ways the Super League is attractive. Like I say, seeing the big clubs in different countries play each other more often is, would, be, would be very attractive. But how to get that to fit with the tradition of promotion relegation, which has sustained the clubs, which, as I said before, are essentially community assets, not just businesses. All right, so for once, I think I've finished within, well, certainly the time I allotted myself. Um, so, uh, here, so this basic su summary, football bank was bankrupt before this crisis. In my view, it's always been bankrupt, pretty much from day one. Um, we're now seeing COVID-19 related insolvencies started and not necessarily true, but I think it's likely that they're going to accelerate over the coming months. I think, uh, I think it wouldn't surprise me. Um, certainly not without some intervention. We might see this provoking intervention, but I'm skeptical. Um, 
as I say, in the short term, the clubs will be bailed out and survive. I see very little reason to think that community assets are going to be dispensed with entirely as a result of this crisis. However, I do think the competitive implications of the revenue compression are likely to enhance competition. And I think that that's likely to lead some of the big clubs to try to limit competition. And the best way for them to do that from their point of view is to end the system of promotion relegation. So I think once again, the system of promotion relegation is likely to be on the table for debate um, in the coming uh, months, years uh, ahead of us. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm being happy to hear thoughts, questions, opinions. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. So, uh, please, questions to Stefan. Well, I can start. Uh, Stefan, I have a question about the financial fair play issues. So you talked about uh, the UEFA and uh, the role of the financial fair play. Uh, we know that now UEFA abolished financial fair play for at least one year. So uh, what do you think will happen in one year? Should, it, sh should this abolishment be prolonged or um, there is a better policy? Well, I, and I think many people here will know that I've been a staunch opponent of financial fair play from the get-go. So you won't be surprised to me to hear me say that they should, uh, they should certainly change it dramatically. I always had the view, this was always my view, that there, were, there are essentially two elements to financial fair play. One is uh, no overdue payables, meaning that you must pay your debts. And the other is um, the break-even rule, which says that you must, be, be, all of your uh, expenditure must be financed out of um, football revenues and not from external injections of capital. Um, the no overdue payables rule, I think, should stay. I think asking people to pay their debts is a sensible thing to do. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's also the law. So um, I, I, think, I think that part of it should be sustained. The bit that should go is the, um, is, is, is the part about um, revenue sources and um, uh, uh, requiring uh, clubs to stand on their own financial bottoms. Uh, they should encourage injections of capital going forward, not discourage them. Uh, please, more questions to Stefan. Stefan, can I ask you a quick question? Hi, Peter. Hello. Um, do you think the if, if they don't go for promotion, they don't remove promotion rele relegation, do you think there's now an increased likelihood of a European Super League? If this makes it more likely now, because I know this is something that you previously discussed at least 20 years ago. Uh, but do you think, given the current crisis and if promotion relegation remains, that it will, there's now an inevitability of a European Super League? Well, you know, I, I should be very careful about predicting anything about Super League. Uh, I gave that up. Uh, you know, more about, about a decade ago, I gave up predicting Super League. Um, actually, to be fair to myself, I, 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 just, I came to the conclusion that Super League wouldn't happen uh, in the mid 2000s and since then because of the rise of the Premier League, because the finances of the Premier League became so much greater than the other clubs, that made, that made, that reduced the incentive of the big English clubs to join in a full throne Super League and therefore, um, that's why it hadn't. That's why it sort of ceased to be a, a realistic possibility. Now, so the question is really what what it means for the. Uh, so the, the best way to think about it is what does it mean for the English clubs? Are the English clubs now going to be more willing to join the Super League, and I think the answer is yes, because I think what the the the, the problem with the Premier League is going to be getting the crowds back to the stadiums and making the stadium environment attractive, and that's. That's going to take quite a while. And in the meantime, what better uh, uh, showcase for the game than playing more games amongst against the biggest clubs in Europe with the biggest talent? 
So I think the big English clubs now have a bigger incentive to try to make such a system work. And so they, they may well try to do so. That's with or without promotion and relegation. The question is, if they set this up, will they do it on their own, independently of UEFA, or will they do it with UEFA? And uh, I suspect UEFA might be quietly concerned about whether they're going to have much of an influence over the actions of the big clubs. Um, and so I, I think that's the issue is, um, you know, do the big clubs really feel that they need the UEFA and the system, the, the governance system anymore, or given the crisis, do they now have, as it were, an excuse to bypass the whole system and do something that is purely in their interest and not in the interest of the football family? Thank you. This next question. Um, I would like to make a comment. Hi, Stefan. How are you? Hi, I like to be So, uh, in that regard, maybe you would be interested um, to know that, uh, for example, the basketball European uh, Euroleague, there are several uh, leagues already in the European basketball. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is good or not, but one example is that um, Maccabi Tel Aviv decided not to play in the Israeli league if uh, Euroleague will take place this year. So this may be just an example of what might happen in football, that the local teams might decide not to participate in the national championship. In the end, they played in the Israeli league because Euroleague, Euroleague did not start this year did not continue, but just an example. That's a great example. And I think, I, I, I must admit, I'm guilty of not paying enough attention to European basketball competi competition structures. But I think they're very interesting. And one of the things I think, in some, I, I've been waiting for somebody to write a history of European basketball, because we know how the American structure evolved, but there's very little information about how Europe's system really evolved over many years. And I think it's a what I mean, these are wonderful examples in, in uh, you know, the evolution of competition and the evolution of uh, competitive structures. Um, and basketball, European basketball is very interesting. And uh, I'm sure COVID-19 is going to lead to some significant restructuring, not just in football, and bo but I think in basketball and, and probably all the other sports as well. Hi, Stepin. Okay, uh, Stefan, I have two comments. One is simply an update about the French uh, top tier League One, okay? Uh, apparently now Toulouse has accepted the sentence, if I can say, to be relegated. And just Amiens uh, went on appeal two days ago, something like that. So probably the only big issue will be with Amiens. Uh, the next point is, uh, that I think that in the background of any analysis of the, the impact of the COVID-19 on football, uh, the main issue is the time horizon that we keep in mind. Look, just to give you an example, now with the French DNCG, the auditing body, we started up a study, not on the two uh, top tiers, but on the third and fourth tier, which are called in French National 1 and National 2, which are the third and the fourth division. And what we observed is that the short-term shock of the COVID-19 is, for many clubs, positive. While in the long run, we, do, we would accept probably that you, your argument that many of your arguments, I would say. But in the short run, what happened? Most of these clubs, none of these clubs get key rights revenues. So they all rely basically on sponsorship revenues and subsidies. When the championship was stopped, the subsidies were, were already paid and the sponsorship revenues also were pocketed by the clubs. And what happened? Without any longer championship, the clubs, since most of them are amateur clubs, stopped paying the players, 
or benefited from uh, money from the government to pay the players. And at the end of the day, all these clubs or most of these clubs were in deficit. And now some of them are in the black, which is a kind of windfall profit from short term windfall profit from the COVID-19 shock. But of course it will not last. It will not last if the next season is disturbed or is not played at all, uh, because then the sponsors will not pay again for a new season or the, 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 the local authorities probably will redistribute the subsidies otherwise. So uh, I, I do agree that the big deal of your analysis is okay, but for the, what I would call the midterm, in the short term, it pertains only for the top tier or the two top tiers probably, at least in a, in a country like France and maybe in some other European countries. Thank you. Uh, this study we are doing is not published yet, but probably we will submit a paper uh, for the European Sport uh, Management Quarterly Special Issues on co COVID and sport. Yeah, interesting. I mean, I mean, I, it, 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 one of the things, been, football is just so different in each country. There's, there's so many local variations, but I, I, and I suspect that that's not un, unusual that you see some pockets where clubs actually temporarily at least do, do fine. I mean, I was struck that some of the first public statements about impending bankruptcy actually were coming from France back in April. So um, clearly, I mean, experience is very mixed. And so um, it's very dangerous to general, overgeneralize. I guess we should be very careful about that. Thank you. Are there other questions? I basically do agree with the idea that the market will become more competitive because in fact, and indeed, the big clubs are uh, more hurt by the crisis than the smaller ones. And this is what we see also in the lower divisions. By the way, you mean intra-league uh, competition, yes? And what about the competition between leagues? Uh, do you expect that uh, some leagues will become stronger than now and maybe some major leagues will become a little bit weaker? It's great. That's a great question. And um, uh, I mean, the implication of, of revenue compression, I think, is, um, is that that should be the case, right? That, that um, in, in some sense, the, the price of talent at the very top end relative to the price of talent at the bottom end should decrease, right? So the, so the gap in the cost of talent should decrease. And therefore, um, that makes any at the level of a league, it should also be the case that leagues with less revenue should have um, more opportunities uh, to compete than leagues with bigger revenues. Thank you. Uh, so, Stefan, thank you once again for your very interesting and very on time presentation. Uh, Thank you. And now we have a couple of closing remarks.